Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Mandy Beal. I pronounce her she, her, and I am this congregation's senior minister. I'm joined in worship leadership this morning by worship associates, Chris Lawn and Tom Raffle. Tom is this morning's guest musician. We also have technical support from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, and today's Zoom greeter is Drika DeGraff. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030, and then later posted on our website and our Facebook page. After the service, we invite you to stay for our wildly popular virtual coffee hour. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We have one announcement this morning. Join me on Tuesday, July 6th on Facebook Live at a new time, 6 p.m. for our monthly Vesper service. The service will include lighting of memorial candles, candles of concern, and a candle of hope and joy. Names and information for candle lighting can be submitted through a link on our website. To view the service, visit the BUC Facebook page at 6 p.m. on Tuesday. The video will also remain on Facebook for later viewing. Today marks the independence of the United States from colonial rule. And we know that the history of our nation is not innocent and that we are on occupied land. The following acknowledgement applies specifically to the geographical area of BUC. There is a unique and rich history of First Nations people in every area of this continent. I invite you to learn about that history in your location. I also invite your close attention. The campus of Birmingham Unitarian Church occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe the Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples. Bloomfield Hills is situated on land that was ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit. We acknowledge Michigan's 12 federally recognized native nations, as well as historic indigenous communities in Michigan. We also acknowledge indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and those who were for forcibly removed from their homelands. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. As we reflect on this complicated history, let us find in ourselves the drive to create justice in our time and to live peaceably on this earth. And now, let us join together in worship. Our prelude this morning is a song by Woody Guthrie that I think all of you will recognize that has its own uh, fraught history of use. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that this was originally a song about anti-authoritarianism. And today I'll sing two verses that you might not have heard in a while. This land is your land, this land is my land From California to the New York Island From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters This land was made for you and me As I was walking that ribbon of highway I saw above me that endless skyway I saw below me that golden valley this land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. I've roamed and rambled, and I've followed my footsteps. The sparkling sands of her diamond deserts And all around me a voice was sounding This land was made for you and me This land is your land, this land is my land From California to the New York Island From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters This land was made for you and me 
In the squares of the city, in the shadow of a steeple, by the relief office, I saw my people. As they stood there hungry, I stood there asking, is this land made for you and me? Nobody living can ever stop me As I go walking that freedom highway Nobody living can make me turn back This land was made for you and me This land is your land, this land is my land From California to the New York Island From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters this land was made for you and me This land is your land This land is my land From California to the New York Island From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters This land was made for you and me This land was made for you and me As we worship in our separate homes this morning, we are joined with a multitude of Unitarian Universalists in lighting our chalice. This chalice is lit in acknowledgement of our individuality, the divine spark with is, which is within each of us. May we be reminded that this flame depends upon its wick which is supported by wax that is held within a metal container. This candle rests upon a chalice that was made by the hands of an artist who bought the clay and its glaze from others. This is an individual flame, but it is by no means alone. Our opening hymn this morning is number 188 in singing the living tradition. Uh, please join me in singing, come, come, whoever you are. Chris, um, you're still on mute. Sorry about that. Our opening words this morning are by Ian W. Riddle. Come one, come all. Come with your missing pieces and your extra screws. Come with your hard edges and your soft spots. Come with your bowed heads and your upright spines. Come all you flamboyant and drab, verbose and quiet, fidgeting and lethargic. All you with large vision and tender hearts, all you with small courage and tender fears, bring your lisp and your stutter and your song. Bring your gravel and your drawl and your lilt. Bring your anger and your joy and your righteous indignation, misfits and conformists and everyone in between. Come into this space and be welcome. Bring who you are, bring where you've traveled, Bring what you long for, and let us worship together. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to create a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. The weekly offering serves as an ongoing reminder of this mission. 
sharing in this weekly practice of generosity also strengthens the bonds between congregants and that high purpose. This is the weekly re-upping of, yes, I want to do that. So let there be an offering in support of this beloved community and our good works. Contributions can be made through our website, through Venmo, username at BUCMI, or good old fashioned check in the mail. However you choose to give, please do so with a heart of gratitude and love for each other. Our offertory this morning uh, is a song that comes from the new century, century hymnal of the U United Church of Christ. Um, it is an adaptation of America the Beautiful that was written by Catherine Lee Bates in 1993. I hope you enjoy it. This is How Beautiful Are Spacious Skies. How beautiful our spacious skies, our amber waves of grain, our purple mountains as they rise above the fruitful plain. America, America, God's gracious gifts abound. And more and more we're grateful for life's bounty all day round. Indigenous and immigrants, our daughters and our sons, oh, may we never rest content till all are truly one. America, America, God grant that we may be a sisterhood and brotherhood from sea to shining sea. How beautiful, sincere laments, the wisdom born of tears, the courage called for to repent, the bloodshed through the years. America, America, God grant that we may be a nation blessed with none oppressed, true land of liberty. We come to the time in our service that we have set aside for prayer and centering spiritual practice. At this point, we stop our recording for confidentiality sake. I invite you to move with me further into a spirit of prayer and reflection. We gather this morning in the mystery and love of our beloved community. We stand in awe before that which is in us, around us, that moves through us, the spirit of love and life. This day is a day that has a complex history. It is a day that we struggle with and that we love and cherish. We have a history that we have to reckon with and we have a future that is bright before us. As we continue to strive for the promises upon which this country was built and the things that we wish and hope that we can be, let us move forward together in love and in unity, respecting the diversity that exists between us and knowing that it is that which makes us stronger. May it be so, amen and blessed be. Spirits of life, come unto me. Sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion. Blow in the wind, 
rise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life the shape of justice. Roots hold me close, wings set me free. Spirit of life, come to me, come to me. We have two readings this morning. The first is an excerpt from a chapter titled Emerson's Shadow. That is chapter 19 of the Cathedral of the World written by Forest Church. Emerson was the quintessential adolescent sage. I don't mean that pejoratively. Adolescence, the passage from childish dependence to maturity is no less necessary a stage for a nation or a faith than for an individual. Coming of age together, Emerson and the United States and the Unitarian movement shared the same adolescent passage. Newly liberated from England, the nation was a child when Emerson was born in 1803. The American Unitarian Association was formed in 1825 when Emerson was studying for the ministry. Quickly thereafter, free thinkers in the movement began to challenge every lingering assumption tying Unitarianism to its Christian heritage. Emerson chafed at all forms of servitude, dedicating his full intellectual energy to the liberation of American letters from outworn and derivative old world models. Our day of dependence, our long apprenticeship to the learning of other lands draws to a close, he wrote in his personal declaration of independence, the American scholar. From the publication of Nature in 1836 until his death in 1882, no figure, political, literary, or religious, better kindled the adolescent spirit necessary for a young people to stand on its own feet and chart a course independent that from its elders. Yet, to be functional, adolescence must be age appropriate. If Emerson's philosophy spoke to his own times, in the meantime, one might hope that our nation and faith have matured. In developmental theory, the progression goes as follows, dependence, independence, interdependence. In an age of boundlessness, Emerson's script, sovereign individualism and self-reliance, does not address today's need for interdependence. This holds true for nation and denomination both. If we are ever to grow up, the anti-institutionalists who gravitate to our institutions must take a little of their precious Emersonian freedom and invest it more generously. Only then will we be bound together in redemptive community. Until we, as Unitarian Universalists, come out from under Emerson's shadow, we will not mature as a movement. In his essay, Self-Reliance, Emerson vehemently argues that a person can only find worth from within themselves, that true genius is unique to each person and can only be corrupted by the influence of others. For instance, he bemoans the loss of the uninhibited independent voice of youth as we learn to speak in an inter interdependent world of the adult. He says, the nonchalance of boys who are sure of a dinner and would disdain as much as a lord to do or say ought to conciliate one, is the healthy attitude of human nature. He cumbers himself never about consequences, about interests. He gives an independent, genuine verdict. These are the voices which we hear in solitude, but they grow faint and inaudible as we enter into the world. Society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Society is a joint stock company in which the members agree for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue it most requests is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. Later, Emerson says, insist on yourself, never imitate. Your own gift can present every moment with the cumulative force of a whole life's cultivation but of the adopted talent of another, you have only an extemporaneous half possession. That which each can do best, none but the maker can teach him. 
it's easy to think that Emerson sees a binary option, either the abject soulless conformity imposed by society or the noble exhilarating independence of the free thinker. I'm told by scholars who have invested way more time than I have in Emerson that this self-reliance Emerson refers to is only a starting point. Self-reliance is relying on one's own personal access to the universal mind, something like what Forrest Church calls one light, many windows. Emerson is really admonishing us to simply find our own window. But that raises a question in my mind, what then? Say I achieve this self-reliance that Emerson describes, what do I do with it? Paradoxically, I don't think I can answer that question by myself. Every July 4th or so, really any opportunity I get, I like to wrestle with the tension between independence and interdependence through the lens of Unitarian Universalism. Like Chris just shared with us, how do we get to interdependence without independence? Otherwise, it's just a mush, right? And we tend to align our Unitarian heritage with independence and universalism with interdependence, but both themes are actually found in both historical Unitarianism and universalism. And today, we're going to take a look at notions of interdependence and the development of American Unitarianism. Kind of. <laughs> the transcendentalist influence on Unitarianism cannot be understated. And perhaps the best known intellectual figures from that period are Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Their influence is still found in modern Unitarian Universalism, although a slightly less nuanced version than, than Chris just presented. We tend to pare it down to that cherished individual freedom, the right to conscience, the ability to chart one's own course without being beholden to tradition, authority, or the beliefs of previous generations. And that is indigenous to Emerson. It's not all there is, but Emerson gets most of the credit for developing these ideas into compelling essays, and rightly so. The exploration of Emerson naturally leads itself to consideration of Thoreau's world role in the development and dissemination of transcendentalist thought. Emerson and Thoreau were conversation partners in their day, and it's appropriate to keep their work in conversation today. At the core of transcendentalism is the belief that each man is endowed with a divine spark that is unique and intrinsic to his nature. I'm gonna clarify right here and now that when I say men, I do mean men. The worldview of those forefathers was limited almost exclusively to wealthy, highly educated white men from New England. It was very specific. They believed that each man's individual spark was his and his alone, and they called that genius. And that genius was the key to his character. But the maturation of that spark was influenced by interactions with others, which in turn influenced personal development. To that end, the transcendentalists kept a very tight social circle to limit the kind of people who would influence them and their personal genius. Now, obviously, they could not completely avoid contact with people outside of that inner sanctum. Even if they didn't engage explicitly with other people, they were tacitly bound to them through cultural institutions and societal expectations. They were expected to do things like have families, keep households, give money to the poor, pay taxes, and vote. And they wrote on these subjects with a range of discomfort, resentment, and downright rancor. These were the means by which they were forced against their will into a certain type of interaction with, with regular people to whom they would never otherwise speak. All cultural institutions and societal norms have been built on the ideas of other men. Participation in society, acceptance of government and its laws and all cultural expectations are social constructs that are specifically imposed yet compulsory. The transcendentalists believe that institutions deserve scrutiny rather than mindless acceptance. Such institutions are abstractions of other people's thinking and values and they are superficial. 
And this is what they hoped to transcend, the laws of men in favor of the inherent and intrinsic laws of nature that would allow them to live without the influence of others, to be just themselves. Like many of our religious forebears, Emerson and Thoreau were abolitionists. They were outraged specifically by the Fugitive Slave Act, and they saw that as an overreach of the federal government into the lives of its citizens. By requiring American citizens to return slaves to their owners, the government was requiring them to participate in injustice. There was no better example of being forced to do something that would corrupt their self-determination and the development of their personal character. Emerson, Thoreau, and others made important intellectual arguments against the Fugitive Slave Act. And Thoreau took it a step further. In an attempt to disentangle himself from involvement with the unjust law, he refused to pay his poll taxes. And one night, when he was visiting friends in Concord, he was approached by a tax collector. He refused again to pay the tax, so he was arrested and in prison. He was released the next day when an anonymous benefactor paid the debt on his behalf, which he was mad about, and he wrote that they shouldn't have done it. He later wrote his objections to the Fugitive Slave Act and his refusal to pay taxes and American imperialism that night in jail in an essay entitled Civil Disobedience. By refusing to pay his poll tax, spending the night in jail, and then later writing about it, Thoreau found a new larger platform to spread transcendentalism. Our young nation, hungry for new uniquely American ideas, was ready to hear the good word of self-determination. As they pushed further west, claiming lands that did not belong to them, Americans were full of notions of exploration, individualism, fresh starts, making it on their own. They wanted to leave behind all vestiges of the old world and make something new from the ground up, completely their own, their own genius. And this supercharged, potentially pathological individualist philosophy of the transcendentalists was an echo of and fueled by those desires. The idea of a guy living alone in a cabin in the woods and choosing imprisonment over paying taxes was very appealing at the time and still resonates today. But that fierce independence of the transcendentalists is not all there is to the story. No matter what they said, no matter what they wrote, they did not exist outside of the context of other humans. It is well documented that Thoreau often walked from Walden to Concord to visit friends. That's what he was doing the night that he was arrested. Plus his mom and his sister did his laundry. And also it bears mentioning that he did not live alone at Walden by any means. Those woods were full of black families, most of whom were formerly enslaved. It is by bemoaning the unavoidable connections of the human condition that Thoreau and Emerson demonstrate that relationships are unavoidable and therefore natural. If a person can corrupt the divine spark, the genius of another, it means that every person has an impact on everyone around them. That's essentially an a priori argument for the inherent interconnectedness. The transcendentalist fantasy of self-reliance, as Emerson called it, was not completely devoid of other people. Even if they could separate themselves from commoners, they willingly surrounded themselves with intellectuals and artists they admired, peers with whom they could debate and sharpen their ideas, and of course, a few women to cook and do the laundry. But Emerson and Thoreau, and indeed all transcendentalists, lived their lives within the context of community, even as they wrote about being completely independent from community. Their understanding of their place in society was convoluted. And despite his disdain for most people, Thoreau's civil disobedience essay, essay includes the following passage. I have never declined paying my highway tax because I am desirous of being a good neighbor as I am desirous of being a bad subject, meaning a subject of the state. And he goes on to say, as for supporting schools, I am doing my part to educate my fellow countrymen now. And this clarifies that he did have a concern for others and he was willing to involve himself with them 
what he refused to accept was expectations of how he would involve himself with others. He chafed at the expectation that he should have allegiance to the state, which would inherently involve him with others without the opportunity for him to direct that involvement. It is the loss of agency that concerned him most. He wanted to act for himself rather than act out of obligation. In other words, he wanted to do it because he wanted to do it, not because somebody else wanted him to. Thoreau might have lived alone in a cabin in the woods, but he still wanted highways and schools to support the well being of his fellow countrymen. Why? The independence that Emerson and Thoreau spoke of has to be placed in historical context. This is about 100 years after American independence and European thought and culture still dominated the Western world and indeed beyond. Freedom from tyranny is a through line in Emerson's and Thoreau's work. Emerson, as the de facto leader of transcendentalism, was interested in taking American freedom one step further by freeing American thought and culture from the hegemony of Europe. The insistence that men should chart their own course without interference from others was necessary for and indicative of the development of our nation's identity. And as Forrest Church wrote, this period of wholesale rejection of authority was imperative to our growth as a nation. I think we've all said or heard a young person say, I'm nothing like my parents. They just don't understand what it's like to be young this day. And that's where America was at the time of Emerson and Thoreau. Their work, their aggressive individualism was totally appropriate and necessary for a young nation struggling to create its own identity. But it has to be said, American independence was about freedom from oppressive tyranny, not freedom from mutual obligation to each other, to being good neighbors. The revolution took place within the context of creating and protecting a commonwealth, the idea of shared well being, a common wealth, is only through cooperation that the United States could be formed. They were united, after all. And of course, there were those who did not want to unite under a federal government. And even amongst those who did, there were tensions and opposing factions, but they shared a common dream of freedom from oppression that they would share together freedom from their own oppression and our nation is built on stolen land by the labor of enslaved people and we must remember that every fourth of july really every day in addition to the narrative recollection of his infamous night in jail there is an anecdotal story about henry david thoreau and the Concord jail this is passed down in uu circles i think we can safely pass it on because uh, one of our foremost hysterian historians, Mark Harris, shared this with me. So I, I think I can tell it to you and, and feel confident that it's real. The story goes that Emerson, thoroughly and completely scandalized, came to the jail to see for himself what had become of his young friend. And when Emerson, who was called Waldo by those who knew him, found Thoreau behind bars, he exclaimed, Egad, Henry, what are you doing in there? To which Thoreau replied, Egad, Waldo, what are you doing out there? Do you see what happened in that story? We're supposed to take away how they were different, but what we can really see here is that Thoreau went to Concord to visit friends, and then he was arrested because he didn't want to pay taxes to fund laws that he thought were unjust toward other people. And then when somebody saw him get arrested, and then they told other people, and then they told other people, and the news made it to his friend, Waldo, and then Waldo went to see him, they were always part of a community. And so are we. Transcendentalists were key to the development of our religion and our nation's personality, our collective divine spark, perhaps ironically. Forest Church is right. It is time for our faith and our nation to step out of Emerson's shadow, a shadow that even he did not cast alone, but along with the support and admiration of his fellows, not the least of which was Thoreau.
the role of Emerson and Thoreau and the other transcendentalists in, de in the development of Unitarianism should never be diminished or discounted. But a few things have happened since that time, both in our country and in our religion. Yesterday's tools are not fitted for tomorrow's tasks. It's time to let go of the myth of the solitary person. It wasn't true in Emerson's and Thoreau's time, and it isn't true now. They were connected whether or not they wanted to be. They were correct that everyone has an impact on everyone else. That is the inherent law of nature. Our need for each other, our total inability to escape, in each, other, to escape each other is our natural state. And the divisions that we create between us is the social construct. Those divisions are what has been handed down to us from previous generations and deserves our scrutiny rather than our fealty, just as they cast off authoritarianism and the institutions of other people the time has come for us to do so. Living into the truth of interconnection and interdependence is the task of Unitarian Universalism in the 21st century. It's time for us to step more fully into our maturity. Just as they cast off those obligations to accept the scholarship opinions and expectations of previous generations, it's time for us to apply the same rubric. Each of us is special and holy and worthy, we each have our own independent spark together. All of us have that together. And when we honor that, that is how we move forward into maturation and interdependence. May it be so. Our closing hymn today is number 121 from Singing the Living Tradition, uh, We'll Build a Land. And I want to point out that um, in the chorus, it says sisters and brothers, and some people prefer to say siblings and cousins, and that's fine. We'll build a land where we bind up the broken. We'll build a land where the captives go free. Where the oil of gladness dissolves all mourning. Oh, we'll build a promised land that can be. Come build a land where sisters and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace. Where justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. We'll build a land where we bring the good tidings to all the afflicted and all those who mourn, and we'll give them garlands instead of ashes. Oh, we'll build a land where peace is born. Come build a land where sisters and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace. But justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. We'll be a land building up ancient cities, raising up devastations from old, restoring ruins of generations. Oh, we'll build a land of people so bold. Come build a land where siblings and cousins, anointed by God, may then create peace. But justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. Come build a land where the mantles of praises resound from spirits once faint and once weak. Where like oaks of righteousness stand her people, oh come build the land, my people we seek. Come build a land where siblings and cousins, anointed by God, may then create peace. Where justice shall roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. There you see.
see how we did that? We all individually decided what we were gonna sing there. And by doing so, we created community. So may we go now out into this world and find ways to be our individual authentic selves in the service of building and loving each other and our interdependence. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.